Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. We're getting close to the official end of this year's legislative session. COVID-19, abortion, guns, and medical marijuana have all been topics of debate. And the Associated Press's Jeffrey Collins and the Post and Courier's Shauna Adcox join us to break down what's been done and what's left. But first, here's more from this week. This week at the State House, the Senate calendar was shortened ahead of the Easter weekend, and House lawmakers were on spring furlough after they approved their version of the $9.8 billion budget last week. Despite the short week, the Senate still made big moves on several bills, including a medical marijuana bill that is now in the Senate calendar and could pass next week, according to the bill's sponsor, Beaufort Republican Senator Tom Davis, who has been fine-tuning this legislation over seven years. This is the most conservative medical cannabis bill in the country. It's got a very restrictive list of qualifying conditions for which there must be underlying empirical objective diagnosis by a physician. It can't simply be subjective. It can't simply be the physician saying, I think this is it. This is the most comprehensive, detailed, conservative medical cannabis bill that I can come up with. And it accomplishes the goal of empowering doctors to help people that we know, we know are suffering. The Senate Finance Committee will start marking up the House budget as it crafts its own version with plans to debate it on the floor later this month. Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Director Frank Rainwater gave the committee an update on the state's finances. Across the nation in fiscal 20, 35 states had general fund revenues that came in below their budget, check, budget collections. South Carolina, we were $462 million above our revised estimate. We had dropped our estimate, but we still came in above projections compared to a lot of other states. The average in the other states, they actually declined revenue in fiscal year 20. We grew 4%. Next week will be fast-paced as lawmakers work to get bills passed to the other chamber by the end of session Thursday, known as Crossover Day. After that day, it becomes harder as well as clearer what will likely make it to the governor's desk by signing die the last day of session on May 13th. There are 18 legislative days left in session, and next Thursday is crossover. There have been several big moments so far in this legislative session, and to recap those and what to expect in the few days ahead, I have Shauna Adcox with the Post and Courier on with me, as well as Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press. We've got two of the top State House reporters with us. Guys, thanks for, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Thanks oh, for good having to us. see you, Gavin. Thanks for having me. Um, so we want to recap a little bit about what's already been passed into law this session before we get into what's going on, what's still working through the chambers. And Jeffrey, I want to start with you. We saw the huge fetal heartbeat bill, the so-called fetal heartbeat bill, get passed into law early on in the session. Uh, went out of the Senate really fast, over to the House. The governor signed it right there in the State House. Uh, it was a big deal, but now it's in federal court. Tell us where we are and how we got here. Well, I checked before we got on today, and so far there have been 12 acts that have been passed, both the House and Senate, so far this session. And there's only three of them you've heard about. The step increases, <laughs> the small raises for teachers, there is a COVID relief package, and then there's the heartbeat abortion bill, which took a good chunk of the first couple of weeks that it kind of sucked the air out those weeks. Um, the bill essentially bans abortions once the fetal heartbeat can be detected, which is somewhere in the general neighborhood of six to eight weeks after conception, which opponents of the bill say that's most women, especially women that aren't expecting to become pregnant, don't know they're pregnant until that time. That bill was immediately, almost immediately, like within hours, a federal judge suspended it, saying that it appears to be unconstitutional based on current, you know, judicial rulings and things like that. So where we're at right now is we're just waiting to see if some case, probably not the South Carolina abortion law, some other abortion law in some other state, gets to the Supreme Court and they choose to overturn the current federal law under Roe versus Wade, which allows abortions up through most of the first trimester in most cases. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey, but that, that bill was a long time coming. I mean, they've tried and tried over the years to get to this point. And then this year, tell us what made the difference, I guess, this year in getting that across the finish line. That bill actually probably passed in, in reality at the beginning of November when Republicans won five seats, you know, two additional House seats, but especially three additional Senate seats. And that gave them 30 senators to 16 Democratic senators. And that was enough to push it over the two thirds procedural hurdle that had been tripping it up. And so that and that and, and in, in honesty, that's kind of the theme of this legislative session is with those few extra Republican seats. We've had a lot of arguments and a lot of tension and everything, and, but not a lot of action yet because we have those additional people and I think people are trying to figure out exactly what they want to push through these last eight weeks. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have some big bills to talk about as well, but I want to stick with things that we have passed, like you're talking about, that have made to the governor's desk. And Shauna, to follow up with what Jeffrey was talking about, we saw some, uh, some funding requests get approved right out of the bat. We are talking about, you know, $208 million for vaccine rollout programs. We are also talking about teacher increases uh, for the current year, as well as um, some charter school funding. Tell us about, about those items and, and how rare it is, I guess, maybe for them to be approved outside of the budget process. Well, you know, we're still operating in the 2019-20 budget. We officially are not, we don't actually have a budget this year. Um, so when they froze the budget last year, that meant that the teachers, what they call stepping, they get um, roughly, it averages 2% for basically a special year in the classroom. Those were frozen last year. So when they came back this year, they put $50 million to basically retroactively give them that money that should be showing up in their uh, bank accounts pretty soon, depending on how quickly the process goes. But they also put aside that $208 million, $14 million for charter schools. Um, it's it's unusual, but it's also unusual that we don't have a state budget this year. So that was basically their stopgap. Mm -hmm. But now we do have a state budget, right? Well, so far, we've seen a House-approved budget at this point. It. Yeah, we're working on it, which is encouraging news. Tell us about that budget, Shauna. It just passed the House. Um, it's now over in the Senate. Tell us some highlights that you've seen in this budget, maybe some surprises as well. $9.8 billion now. Well, it, there, are, there are very few surprises, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, as has been the case the last few years, the House, uh, the, the legislature and the governor's working better than they have, say, in previous governors. Uh, there's a lot in there that the governor put in his executive proposal. Part of that is because legislative leaders and the governor get together as the governor's putting his together. Um, but some of the amounts are different, but some of the things that are exactly the same, a big thing is the 500 million put into reserves. Mm -hmm. That's just set aside. Um, they also put $30 million to continue the broadband efforts. Obviously the pandemic showed the digital divide in this state, what a problem that is both educationally um, because of health care, economically. Um, and there's about $20 million for law enforcement pay raises. Mm -hmm. Doesn't continue that another step for teachers, but other than that, there's no increase for state employees across the board. But the, the one thing about this budget, as opposed to previous years, while budgets always start in the House, this is, as I've said before, it a very much of a rough draft more than normal hmm. because uh, we're going to get a new estimate this coming week from the state's revenue forecasters. We expect it to show we have a lot more money than the house had to work with. And plus it, uh, you know, we're going to get about $2 billion from that latest congressional act. Well, we have several years to spend that. So I don't expect the legislature to do that all in one shot, but that combined with the, well, we also have $600 million of a law enforcement, I mean, a, a Department of Energy so, uh, lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So all that is yet to be worked out that probably will be debated May, June. <laughs> Yeah, or fiscal year starts July 1st, sure. yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because in the China, I mean, we, we did see our, our budget get, or, you know, the estimates were obviously revised throughout the past year. Uh, but right now what the House was working with, they had about, what, like $189 million in growth and then, you know, 770-some million dollars in one-time dollars. So that's kind of what they're working with right now. We're, we're, that's why we're seeing such large sums, at least that half a billion dollars being socked away in case of, you know, future yeah, problems. even after that $200 million was set aside for vaccines, the House still had a billion to work with. Mm -hmm. Now, less than $200 million of that is for what we call recurring expenses, you know, things, salaries, things that go year after year. Um, but we are faring much better than other states. Um, part of that is because of our conservative revenue forecast over the last few years. We put in, we've taken in a lot more money than they forecasted. Mm -hmm. And so... so <clears throat> Again, and, well, I said, and as, as Frank Rainwater with the BEA said earlier this week, um, that w just the paychecks alone last spring put $4.3 billion directly into people's pockets. And that is, I think he said, uh, more than the entire state uh, payroll. <laughs> we're state employees, yeah. When when you see all that economic stimulus coming to the state, you, you know we're seeing it just getting juiced up here, and we're 
we're pretty fortunate compared to some other states too. I mean, Jeffrey, we don't have to do any budget cuts. There were no big, no big issues here. I mean, obviously, we're not getting everything everyone wants, but it, no one's no one's getting cut here. No, and and that and you know the the lesson in the state house that you keep hearing over and over again, and for those of us like Sean and I who lived through it, is the Great Recession of two thousand and eight and the massive cuts. I mean, South Carolina lost about twenty five percent of its budget in you know a little over a year and a half in that Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So we've done worlds better this time. I and mean, like I said, no cuts, no employees let go. It's actually been very soft. Mm -hmm. as far as the impacts. And even the potential for, for state employee pay raises, I know there's been some, they are covering uh, what the premium increases like they always right. do for healthcare, but that's gonna be, we're gonna see some Inflation more debate. Increases. We'll probably see some more debate about what can be done. I'm, I'm guessing the closer we get to July 1st and, and when we get more revenue I estimates. I think it's a pretty good chance that state employees are gonna get that an across the board pay raise of some sort. Mm -hmm. Joe. Yeah, no they doubt. Don't, I mean, they you know, the Kill a Cop Hunter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, I want to I want to kind of move on to COVID-based bills here. You know, we uh, we've seen a lot of action going on here, with uh, one specifically hundreds of million dollars in federal assistance for rental assistance moving through the state house right now. It's a House-approved bill that's just got through the Senate. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? And again, kind of sticking with the theme of this money coming from the feds and how it's going to help our state. Yeah. So the money actually goes mostly towards landlords in the end. So like if somebody hasn't been able to pay their rent for months, or I guess at this point, it could be over a year since yeah. we started the pandemic, um, that money would go to the landlords to cover the, the rent. And then the person that hasn't paid the rent could would not be evicted. So right now it goes back to the House. The Senate made a few minor changes, but I suspect the House next week will be okay with that. And that money will start to flow. Uh, the the you know, government agency responsible for it says they'll send out, you know, start sending out kind of the regulations and how this is going to work once it gets passed. So that's one, another big pot of federal money that's come to South Carolina to help us out. And out like, again, again, to make it much, a much softer landing from all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, I think $346 million there. And, and it's also split up among some smaller housing authorities across the state too. And, you know, we just had the housing authority, SE Housing on our show the other month. And they, they had a $25 million rental assistance program going on that had already expired. So it just really shows the need for for this money out there right now for utilities and for rent. Um, and Sean, I kind of want to uh, keep it with these COVID bills. You know, we, we've seen a lot of activity, at least earlier in the session, when it came to trying to get teachers vaccinated in phase 1A. Uh, they got pushed to phase 1B with a lot of people. That's been people. ongoing since March 8th. Uh, that was a big push by Senator Shane Massey. I want to talk a little bit about the politics behind that push with the governor there. Uh, but that, that bill failed, but we have been seeing some more education bills specifically going full five day a week options for schools uh, this month. Tell us about those and then maybe some other ones, including this COVID liability bill that's also been debated. Well, so just yesterday, the Senate passed the bill requiring all school districts to offer five days a week in the classroom starting April 12th, which most school districts already plan to do so anyway. Um, but it does ensure all districts, including the small rural ones that, that where kids really need a lot of help to be in the classroom um, for at least the last month of the school year. Um, it also, to what teachers like about it is it guarantees that next school year they won't be required or should guarantee that they wouldn't be required to both teach online like we're doing now and in front of their classroom, essentially had the same teach twice, you know, double duty mm -hmm. as some of them are doing now. Um, it says if that if in extraordinary circumstances that's required that teachers would actually be paid extra to do that. Now, it, it goes to the House next week. You know, April 12th is coming really quick. So the House is going to have to move next week on that for it to really work. Mm -hmm. And that COVID liability bill also went through the Senate. That was a big bill, big push by business to make sure that, you know, businesses don't get yeah, sued. Yeah, if you happen to get COVID and, you know, you can't, it says you can't sue the business and say, oh, I got COVID at your place. Um, but... I don't expect it honestly to go anywhere in the house. Mm -hmm. It seems like a tough sell. It's a pretty tricky bill. It sounds like. Yeah. The house judiciary chairman, even before the session started said he didn't see a need for it because the thing is, is it, it's very difficult to prove you've got COVID in any particular spot with all the places to pick it up. Um, I, I, anyway, I, even Republicans don't see a need for it. Mm -hmm. 
Jeffrey, I want to uh, maybe stick with some bills, you know, that we saw as a result of this crisis, this pandemic we've been in for now more than a year. Uh, talking with curbside beer and, and wine pickup, as well as delivery. Uh, and then also, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, churches becoming essential services during emergencies. That was a big push in the house for that. And then also moved to break up DHEC, which has been the lead agency on the response to COVID-19. Uh, tell us about these bills and how things are changed because of the pandemic. Um, crisis sometimes leads to innovation. So in the case of the beer and the wine and the curbside pickup <coughs> and the delivery thing is, you know, these are all things that were put into effect in on an emergency basis when the pandemic started, part of, you know, the governor's emergency powers. And now that at some point we should wane off the state of emergency, the thought was, well, you know, it's a convenient thing to be able to pick up some beer or wine or, or alcohol as part of your restaurant meal when you get a to-go meal or to have wine delivered to your house as part of your you know, Instacart or your grocery run. So that bill has been passed by the House. It goes to the Senate. We'll see what they do. Um, the DHEC breakup thing is kind of interesting because in a way it's the other side of things, right? So could the crisis maybe keep people from splitting up DHEC? One of the things that people that are are against splitting up DHEC, including DHEC employees have mentioned, is that they were able to pull employees in on a temporary basis from the environmental side of the agency because it's so large to come in and help them out with this healthcare crisis. And of course, the reverse could be true, you know, if there was an environmental crisis. Now, state lawmakers, especially, you know, Senate President Harvey Peeler is in the lead of this, think that agency is too big. And there's certainly an argument to wonder why, you know, an agency that does all this healthcare stuff is also doing all this environmental stuff. And can you really do both? well if you know it's such a big job and the third bill i think you mentioned was the let's see if or, i can uh, remember churches being deemed essential oh, yeah, the and, churches, and, and yes. also if you want to talk about the governor's emergency powers we just mentioned oh, emergency yeah. powers and you know he keeps renewing these you know emergency orders which have you know Over caused some concern at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah every two weeks we get a new one yeah the, yeah the, the church deal is that you know there were some people especially conservative republicans that worried that churches could be closed by a governor's order, emergency order. Henry McMaster was not going to close churches. For one, it's not in his, you know, he's a very constitutionalist, so he felt like it would break the First Amendment, you know, freedom of religion. And also, that's, he's just not going to do that. I mean, a, conservative, a, Repub a governor in South Carolina doing that would just be fatal. But the, um, so, but just to be on the safe side, you know, they, that made churches an essential business. So they, if, as long as other essential businesses like grocery stores are open, churches can stay open. And, you know, the emergency power thing is another, you know, it's one of those things South Carolina has been around 250 years. So we've, we have a, a structure for the governor to have emergency powers, but it doesn't have a real modern feel to it. So as of now, the governor issues an emergency decree and every two weeks he issues another one because they only last 15 days. Mm -hmm. Well, he tweaks a couple of words. He can't, issue the same one over and over again, that's not allowed. So what he does is he moves around some words or he removes this clause or adds that clause. And, you know, the governor and the legislature agree that's not a good system. So it looks like right now it's still working its way, but it looks like we'll have some kind of system where the legislature gets a check on it, where mm -hmm. the governor issues his emergency decree. If a certain number of legislators or county legislative delegations or that that's the details they're working out, say, hey, we want to say in this, then they can vote, they can come to Columbia or whatever arrangement they have to meet at that point and, you know, and have a say in what the governor does instead of it just being a governor's kind of fiat declaration. Yeah. And Henry McMaster says that's fine. I mean, I, I don't think they've encroached enough on his power to upset him in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we heard about in the state of the state. Well, it does mean he doesn't have to keep issuing those things every 15 days. <laughs> yeah. That's true. How tired is Mark Hammond getting stamped on the <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But, uh, Jeffrey, we have about seven minutes left. We have a lot of things to still talk about. I want to talk about this Gallo Winery. I'm going to use the term winery loosely because it's going to be a production facility up there in Chester County, uh, but also some tasting rooms. Tell us the big deal, uh, the big hubbub around that, and maybe tie it into some other commerce-related bills we've seen moving, at least through the Senate right now. I, I have to say I've enjoyed this modern South Carolina General Assembly thing of having really odd economic development discussions. You know, we have the Carolina Panthers that dominated 2019 and Gallo may end up you know, dominating some of the time in 2021. What Gallo wants to do is in Chester County, which is really rural between Columbia and, and uh, Charlotte, mm -hmm. they want to build a bottling facility and warehouse, just a huge complex for them. And uh, it would it would bring in about 400 million people, about 500, 400, 400 million dollars. Yes, that's a lot of people and 500 <laughs> people, roughly mm -hmm. be a very big investment for a rural poor county. 
the the and so normally that would just breeze right on through. I mean, I the General Assembly wouldn't have a problem with that at all, even with some small incentives. But what Gallo wants to do that's causing all the the problem is they want to create what's now through called three tasting rooms. What it would be is there could be about a dozen people at a time would come into a room, they taste a bunch of different wines. You know, you have a light, you know, a nice little gathering with your friends or your family. And then the, conceivably, if you like one or two of the bottles, then you would buy them from a store on the site. And that, you know, alcohol retailers don't like that. They feel like that that is allowing Gallo to broach in on their territory. Restaurants are not as quite as enthusiastic either because, again, they feel like Gallo's broaching in on their territory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, South Carolina <laughs> has a very interesting, might be the way of putting Perfect it, system word, yes. selling <laughs> alcohol. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's a very complex, you know, there's li limited number of people can, you know, there's a limited number of alcohol stores that a particular uh person can own. So this gets all tied up into, into that. And so the tripping point is these tasting rooms. And Gallo has reduced them to, from four to three to try to get it passed. They've reduced the hours they can run because they wanted to run them late into the night because, you know, people like to do things later at night. But now they're closing at 530. So um, it's out of the Senate judicial, uh, out of Senate, the Senate committee. It's now on the Senate floor. We'll see what happens next week. Yeah. I think it probably has a pretty good shot at passing, but you never know. Yeah, well, Shauna, um, we have seen one bill pass over in the House, a big one for Republicans, and that's the Open Carry uh, with Permit Act. We're talking about guns here. Give us a load on that and where you see that going in the Senate. There's also another bill in the House, too. Uh, we have about less than five minutes. So I want to cover a couple more, but what's going on with that bill in the Senate now? Okay, so on open, uh, open carry with training, it basically means that if you have a CWP, uh, you don't have to have your gun concealed. Mm -hmm. You don't have a suit jacket over, you know, your holster, essentially. Um, but you do have to have a CWP. All the, the rules of where you can legally carry still apply. Um, and so that is in the Senate. And then I think that would be more palatable to the Senate, whether it actually moves in the Senate, yet to see. Um, now, what's going to be in the House next week is the what they call constitutional carry, which means anybody and everybody can just carry handgun training, bleh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> So that I don't think is going to possibly go anywhere in the Senate. Mm -hmm. But would be another but, big, yeah. When we talk, at least when we're talking about with the one with the uh, the open carry with training, this could still be a big win for Republicans uh, as we keep talking about these big wins uh, for this session. Jeffrey, another interesting move we've seen this week, especially is medical marijuana. It just got voted out of the Senate Medical Affairs Committee on Wednesday. Uh, give me give me an idea about this bill that's been. You know, Senator Tom Davis's baby for the past seven years and, and where we are right now in its future. It sounds kind of promising, according to him. Yeah, Tom Davis is a Republican, was Mark Sanford's chief of staff. So, you know, but this has been something he has been top priority for seven years. Um, it's at, he they did. They didn't worry about having a subcommittee hearing. They just passed it straight out of the Medical Affairs Committee uh, on Wednesday. And. Davis insists that he has enough support to pass this thing out of the Senate. Wait to be seen. I mean, there's there's a lot of skeptical Republicans and some skeptical Democrats that that aren't sure that South Carolina needs to legalize marijuana in any form, even medical marijuana. Davis insists this is a very conservative bill. You'd have to meet with a doctor in person. You have to have a written uh, plan. You couldn't smoke the marijuana. It'd have to be used as an oil or something like that. Um, this isn't, you know, I think Tom Davis thinks he can get a hearing on it before crossover, uh, get a vote on it before crossover deadline coming up next Thursday. We'll see. I mean, I, it, it seems like every year he gets a little closer to this. I'm not sure he's quite reached the end zone mm -hmm. to use a football metaphor, but, you know, he's close. We'll see. Yeah, it's an incredibly tight bill, one that keeps getting tighter and tighter over these years. And yeah. uh, it's interesting to see that we have seen more co-sponsors added to that bill, such as the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Hugh Leatherman, Senate Judiciary Chairman Luke Rankin. Then we've also heard from the governor saying he's a little bit more warm to this, too. So. I mean, that was shocking, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that was so surprise. I mean, I'm not, you know, we always, you know, kind of suspend logic a little bit when we cover the state house, but who knows what could happen, you know, with this bill at this point because it has gotten to this point before, but has always been obstructed a bit on the Senate floor. Well, and and even uh, even the opponents will say that Tom Davis has has brought them from an absolute no to at least listening. And I mean, you know, Shane Massey, the Senate Majority Leader, says he he's leaning towards voting for it just off of Davis's repeated and continuous and and fierce advocacy for it. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey, with a minute left, um, the hate crimes bill over in the, the House was part of a big slate of bills that the uh, House uh, committee formed last summer in the wake of George Floyd's death and the protests that ensued. Uh, it's finally working its way onto the calendar. Uh, can you give us an update about that bill and where it might be going, especially with crossover approaching? 
Yeah, hate crimes is probably going to be the House really wants to get that passed before that also that Thursday crossover deadline. And there's been some back and forth. You know, they've removed some things. They removed uh, LBGTQ protections at one point. They re-added them. Now they've removed out vandalism as as or uh, harassment as something that can lead to a hate crime enhancement. There's some argument that in that case, all you're doing is allowing a hate crime for someone that gets beaten terribly, not someone that has a racial slur sprayed on their church or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, the House is determined to pass this business wants it done and when business wants something done the house usually says okay sure thing mm -hmm. so but there's there's this very conservative argument against it and this is one point where all of that extra republican push might actually end up hurting this bill because they the conservative republicans are worried that this will affect their religious uh, friends, the people that don't are against abortions and things like that, that they may end up having being on the wrong end of this at some point. And Shana, we're wrapping up here. We're running out of time. Uh, redistricting, we didn't talk about it, but it sounds like it's going to be one of those things we deal with an off session just because the census data has been delayed fall. and it's going to be. September, October. Yeah, it's going to be a long time coming there. So. Uh, Merry Christmas, redistricting. <laughs> well, I mean, is there any word that we could see our primaries get pushed back at that point as a result? Any anything? That's uh, about? I, I mean, I, people are talking about that, but I, I think they'll work late to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, if the primaries get delayed, it'll probably be a lawsuit situation. You know, something got sued and it got uh, and a judge decided that they just can't go forward. Well, here we go. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on the remaining days with Shauna Atcox with the Post and Courier and Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. To keep you updated throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host multiple times a week, and you can find it on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.